the Arrhenius equation. So in the Arrhenius equation, he represented a number of factors. One is the, represents the relationship uh, between the rate constant, uh, the frequency factor, which basically relates to the frequency of collision of uh, the molecules that are reacting, the activation energy, and the temperature. So if you have a look at this equation here, represented as, uh, uh, as the Arrhenius equation, it says lin k is equal to lin a minus e over r multiplied by one over t. So if you have a look at this, uh, what it is simply saying is that the rate constant is directly, directly proportional to A, okay, which is uh, the frequency factor, and also uh, directly proportional to uh, E, which is the activation energy, but inversely proportional to the inverse of uh, uh, temperature. Still admitting people, R here uh, represents uh, uh, a constant. So from this uh, equation, what it tells you, if you, maybe we get back to it a bit. If you were to represent this equation as a, uh, an equation of a straight line. Uh, equation of a straight line is uh, y is equal to mx uh, plus c. So y is here. Uh, this is representing uh, what you would call classically at mx, which is b will be representing the gradient, and this is the x-axis. And this a, which is in a, will be representing uh, the constant, which is, uh, in essence, uh, the y-intercept. You can also represent the same Arrhenius uh, equation in form of uh, uh, log representation. So in this case, you have got log k is equal to log a minus uh, E over 2.303 R multiplied by one over T. So if you uh, are to represent this as an equation of a straight line, uh, what it tells you then uh, is that if you were to plot lin K or log K against uh, the inverse uh, of temperature, what you should get is a straight line. And from there, you can then uh, calculate the value of E, and you can also calculate the value of A from the gradient and the intercept. So in this case, uh, the temperature that you use must be converted to uh, Kelvins and should not be uh, in degrees Celsius. Do we know how to convert uh, degree Celsius to Kelvin? Anyone? Yes, yes, sir. How do you convert? Uh, you add uh, whatever value of a uh, degree Celsius to yes. 273.15. Yes. Did everyone get that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so at all times, before you begin your, your calculations, ensure that you change uh, the degree Celsius uh, into Kelvins. It's a very common mistake. Uh, people under stress uh, simply go straight and begin, begin to use the degree Celsius and your answers will be terribly wrong. So we'll get back to the significance of uh, uh, this relationship, the Arrhenius uh, 
theory and the equation and what it means uh, for you uh, to be able to get these parameters which we have. This has got an application uh, when you are determining the shelf life of uh, a product or a drug substance. So for now, I want us to talk about what we refer to as the accelerated stability testing. But we all know that uh, with time, all medicinal products are going to decompose. So whether you, you're talking about the active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, and also uh, the product that arises from them, with time, these products are going to be decomposing. Instabilities in modern formulation are only detectable after considerable storage period, uh, periods under normal circumstances. So if you were going to notice or detect how the drugs or the medicines are degrading, you can only detect that degradation uh, after a long period of time, if you were to keep these products under the normal uh, uh, storage conditions, uh, which you con could consider, say, for example, at room temperature. If you were to put uh, a medicinal product at room temperature and begin to observe uh, how it is uh, de decomposing, it is going to take you a long, long time for you to eventually be able to uh, notice that it is degrading. Unless, of course, your product is just very poor product, then you, you are going to get uh, uh, the degradation within a short period of time. So the issue with that is that uh, under drug uh, development, you are going to take a long, long time uh, for you okay are you there yes sir yeah. yes, so if, yes. if you are going to use the normal storage conditions someone is playing music oh Thank you. Okay, so if you are going to use the normal storage conditions like room temperature to determine the shelf life, it will take you years and uh, time uh, is money in product development. So what we do <coughs> is to expose uh, the product to what we refer to as high stress conditions, okay? So instead of using the normal temperature, you use an elevated temperature. If you, instead of using uh, just the uh, normal humidity, you increase the humidity, you can increase the light. So conditions of temperature, humidity, and light intensity uh, that are known uh, from experience to be likely causes of the breakdown. So you increase these values, the value of temperature, humidity, and light intensity. Uh, these are referred to as high stress uh, conditions. And in doing so, you are increasing uh, the rate at which uh, the degradation is going to take place. So high stress conditions enhance the deterioration of the product and therefore reduce the time required for testing. So if you increase these uh, high stress con uh, uh, conditions, you are likely to see the degradation of the product within a short period of time. That will allow you to gather more data within a short period of time. And you can then use that data to predict how 
the product is likely to behave over a prolonged period of time under normal uh, storage conditions. So this entire uh, process uh, where you expose the product to high stress conditions is what we refer to as the accelerated stability testing. Accelerated in the sense that you want to do things, a lot of things within a short period of time. So what we do is uh, you might expose, for example, you, you start looking at uh, uh, degradation of a product, maybe at three high temperatures, it could be 80, 90, and 100 degrees Celsius. And from there, you are going to gather data, which you can then use to extrapolate uh, how the behavior of that product is going to be at uh, storage uh, temperature such as 25 degrees Celsius. I I'll talk more about this uh, later as we go on. But we get to see that uh, the principle of accelerated uh, stability testing also has got a number of uh, uh, issues that you have to consider. Extrapolations to normal storage conditions must be made with care. You must make uh, reasonable assumptions uh, for you uh, to take these extrapolations. Some of the assumptions uh, have to be made and they must be reasonable. So the formulator must be sure that such extrapolations are valid. Uh, if you conduct experiments at say 60 degrees Celsius, you get the data. Uh, and you are able to see how the product is uh, 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 decomposing. And then you tell people that you are extrapolating the same data to see how the product is going to decompose at 25 degrees Celsius. You must be certain that uh, uh, such an extrapolation is going to be valid, okay? So under normal circumstances, because sometimes you are never sure whether that extrapolation can actually hold true, you need what we refer to as a, a control test, which is going to be uh, a way of vindicating the assumptions that you made. So while you are conducting uh, accelerated stability studies at uh, high stress conditions, you are they going to have a concurrent batch under expected normal conditions, okay? So you keep a certain, that product also at 25 degrees Celsius, keep it there for as long as possible. So it could be a product that's kept maybe for three years, uh, it's just there. Then you'll be observing how it is uh, disintegrating or uh, decomposing uh, to be precise. This is going to act as a vindicator. At the end of uh, the experiments, the data that you are going to get from this concurrent batch should be closely related to the extrapolations that you made when you conducted your experiments uh, under high stress conditions. Okay. So if you look at the accelerated tests, this uh, can be defined uh, in a number of ways. It may be defined as the rapid detection of deterioration differential in different initial formulations of the same product. As the name is suggesting, you simply want to accelerate the process. So you expose the product to high stress conditions so that it allows you to rapidly detect uh, any uh, uh, changes, deterioration that is likely to happen uh, in the same product. This is, is of use in selecting the best formulation from a possible, uh, from a series of possible choices. We call this uh, uh, optimization of formulation. So from the initial stages, you can expose your formulations to these high stress conditions and you will be able to note which one is degrading way too faster or which one is able to withstand uh, the 
uh, high stress conditions for a prolonged period of time. And in essence, it will indicate that that is the product which is uh, more stable uh, compared to the rest. So you can pick that for further development. So that is the uh, optimization. And then you can also have the prediction of half-life and we'll be using this uh, information uh, shortly. You can use accelerated tests to determine uh, the shelf life. You want to predict how long is this product likely uh, uh, to stay viable. Also, the provision of rapid means of quality control. So you can tell within a short period of time, if a product is uh, decomposing, then you know that that product is not of good quality and you can remove that formulation from, uh, uh, from the developmental uh, stages. Okay. So good formulations will invariably break down more slowly than poor ones. This is what I was talking about. If you've got a good formulation, you expect that it will withstand the high stress conditions uh, uh, much better compared to the poor formulations. So such uh, tests allow formulations to be optimized very quickly. You can quickly choose which ones you need to uh, uh, to develop further or which ones you need to uh, discard. When you've decided that this is the optimal formulation, attempts can be made to predict its likely stability at uh, proposed storage conditions. So you started by simply having a look at the various uh, formulations, you expose them to uh, high stress, uh, some of them go on to decompose, and you choose what you refer to as the optimal formulation. When you have this optimal formulation, you can then have a look at uh, its likely stability at proposed uh, storage conditions, uh, which can be, this may be 25 degrees or any other. Uh, this issue of choosing which one is going to be the storage conditions is going to differ depending on uh, a number of things. Uh, and so, uh, mostly you have to have a look at the properties of the drug itself, uh, also have a look at where you are going to be using that product. Uh, all those are going to be factors that are going to dictate uh, where the product might be considered uh, as uh, an ideal uh, storage space. Okay. So there are various protocols that are available. Uh, I'll talk about uh, just a few. Uh, what we consider when you are uh, conducting stability tests. So accelerated testing requires the careful design of protocols, which must define clearly the following. So when you talk about storage uh, conditions and stability testing, the parameters that are involved uh, must be clearly defined. The key things that have been uh, shown to, uh, uh, to affect stability of the drugs uh, include temperature, humidity, okay, and also light. These three are well known. I think we, we did, did we get to have a look at uh, uh, degradation of, uh, of products where we looked at uh, photo degradation, uh, hydrolysis, and so on. We did that, right? Yes. Yes, I did that. Yes, yeah. yes, we did. So those are the things that we still stick to when we go to stability testing protocols. So you must define very clearly the temperature and the humidity for storage. At the, time, at the same time, you must define storage time before sampling. So you are going to keep the product uh, uh, under specific conditions. And then over a period of time, you will be uh, taking uh, products out of that storage space 
and testing for a number of things, okay? So you will be testing for assay, you conduct the assay check, how much of the active ingredient is still there. Then you can also have a look at uh, uh, simply the appearance of the product, the physical appearance. Uh, is it changing? Is the color changing? All those things you'll be doing that. But you must define storage time before sampling. How long do you need to keep the product before uh, you take them out for testing? Then you must also define the number of batches to be sampled. Okay, so if you are producing a product you produce the product in a number of batches, the number of batches that you, you've made. So what number of batches are you going to sample during your stability testing? Then the number of replicates within each batch. So if you get uh, uh, one batch, how many uh, uh, replicates, replicates or tablets uh, that are you going to test? Okay, so if a batch has got uh, 1,000 tablets, uh, how many of them uh, do you need to, to have a look at? Uh, ideally speaking, uh, stability testing is conducted uh, in the final packaging container. So when we say replicates, uh, it will entail that uh, maybe the packaging container uh, could be having uh, 20 tablets each. So how many containers from each batch do you need to conduct stability test on? And that must be uh, clearly defined. Then a suitable light challenge. Uh, we are using suitable light challenge here uh, because uh, different uh, light intensities are used during uh, stability testing. And when we say suitable, it must be something that is going to mimic uh, perhaps the environment, the light in the environment where this product is uh, uh, likely to be used and stored. And then the details of the assay, uh, how are you going to be determining the quantity of the active ingredient uh, that is uh, being uh, determined uh, or looked at at every point when you are conducting uh, stability testing. Okay, so there are a number of approaches that we use uh, when we are looking at uh, stability protocols. Uh, the first one is, is referred to as uh, the factorial analysis. Uh, in classic sense, I think there are just about two which are commonly used. Uh, in the factorial analysis, uh, this is a simple approach uh, for gauging the likely effect of additional factors for which no simple descriptive relationship such as the Arrhenius uh, equation exists. So if you have a look at uh, the Arrhenius uh, theory, we, we know that the Arrhenius equation doesn't account, for example, the, uh, for the impact of uh, humidity it does not account for the impact of light, okay? So we see that uh, yet these are still some of the factors that affect the stability of the product. So we can use the factorial analysis to gauge the likely effect of uh, the additional factors. The Arrhenius uh, equation simply considered uh, uh, the effect of uh, uh, temperature on drug decomposition, okay? So it may be reasonably suspected that light and humidity cause degradation, okay, uh, of a freeze-dried antibiotic powder. The powder is there for stored under low and high stress in sealed vessels over water or descant on window seals and in the cupboards. So this is what we are trying to say to just illustrate what we are saying. If you are suspecting that uh, light and humidity uh, can have uh, effect on degradation, you can use the factorial analysis uh, for you to predict the impact of 
these two factors. Okay, so typical results you are likely to get from factorial analysis would be, for example, you the small h is representing low humidity. Are we together? Yes, then sir. the small l here is representing uh, the low light intensity. The capital H is representing high humidity. And then the capital L is representing the uh, high intensity light. So some of the results you might get, uh, if you expose, uh, for example, this is the typical results, you expose the powder we've talked about to uh, low humidity and low intensity light, and you find that the drug has decomposed by 8%. Then you expose the same powder to high humidity and low light, and you find that it has decomposed by 39%. Then you expose this uh, product to low humidity and high light intensity, and it decomposes by 16%. When you expose uh, to the high values of humidity and intensity, it decomposes by 47%. Okay? Then we can calculate the average decomposition at high humidity from here. Okay? We see, we go back to the results there. Where there is high humidity is where you've got capital H. We see that there is 39, and then there is also 47. So the average, these are two data sets we have. We see that the average decomposition at high humidity is going to be 39 plus 47 divided by two, which is equal to 42%, okay? Then the average decomposition at low humidity. So we go where there is a uh, small letter H. This is uh, low humidity. This is eight. Again, low humidity is 39. So if you add uh, What is 39? Uh, if you add uh, 39, uh, just to make sure we're sure of the time. Wait. Oh, humidity, small h is 8, and then here small h is 16. 16 plus 8 is 24. 24 divided by 2 is 12. This is the 12 that we have here. So the scaled effect of humidity is then calculated as the decompo average decomposition at high humidity minus average decomposition at low humidity. This is going to be 42 minus 12 equals 30 percent. So we see that Humidity uh, on average, its effect on the stability of the product of decomposition is 30%. The product is uh, degrading. Humidity is contributing 30% degradation uh, of the product. Similarly, you can then consider the effect of light. Okay. So again, you go by using at high light intensity. We see that it's 16 plus 47. So if you use your calculator, we see that 
the average is uh, 31.5. Then you can look at uh, the lower intensity light. Monica, please say what you want to say. Yes, Monica, you want to say something? Monica, the raised hand. Okay, if there's no response, I'll continue. So if you go to the small uh, eye, we see that you've got eight. And also you have 39. So eight plus 39 gives you 47. 47 divided by two is 23.5. So if you now have a look at the scaled effect of light, you subtract 23.5 from which is giving you this value eight here. Okay, I can take a question. Are we clear there? Yes, sir. Very clear. We are clear. Okay. Thank you. So this is what we refer to as the factorial uh, analysis. So the, thus, although both light and humidity cause decomposition, here in this example we have used, we can see that humidity poses a, a greater threat to stability. And uh, obviously, from your principles of uh, uh, drug uh, degradation and the mechanisms of drug degradation, we can see that uh, probably this uh, drug powder is uh, uh, undergoing hydrolysis. Then you, we have what we refer to as uh, the structured approach. Uh, here, you can have at least two or three batches which are stored as indicated and subsequently tested in uh, duplicates. Uh, products in here have to be in the final container. Uh, uh, if uh, at this stage the final pack has not been confirmed, uh, a, range, a range of parts and pack materials can be tested. And, uh, this will be a case of um, compatibility studies. You test for compatibility between the product and the packaging materials during compatibility testing. So you can have tablets which can be stored in uh, glass bottles or uh, high density polyethylene containers, aluminum foil, and so on, different types of uh, uh, storage materials. And then uh, you can see where degradation is happening faster. Uh, that will indicate that there is a potential uh, harmful interaction between the packaging container and the product that you have put in there. And the container. It's going to show least degradation is the one that you can pick uh, as a storage container. Uh, some batches of liquid products may be stored in inverted position to check for interaction. So it is in that of. Someone quickly, quickly, someone. I'm waiting. How are you going to determine the order of reaction using this data set? Quickly.
someone to take us through, someone to say something. How are you going to determine the order of reaction? You plot the graphs and check if the line is straight or not straight for the different orders. Yes. So you go back to the order of reaction using experimental data. Okay. You plot, you test whether it is a first order or second order or zero order. Once you have determined uh, the order of reaction, you, you can then know that uh, the decomposition of this product is following, let's say for example, it's following first order. Once you are certain that it is following first order, you can then use that information to determine Number three, next step, determine rate constant at different elevated temperatures. Determine rate constants at different elevated temperatures. Okay? And it becomes easy because you now know the order of the reaction. So simply plot the data sets that you have according to that, uh, uh, that uh, experimental data you have and the order of reaction you determined and get the rate constants, okay? We know how to determine the rate constant from experimental data. So you determine, the rate constant at different elevated temperatures. So once you have uh, rate constants, you can now use the Arrhenius equation to plot the graph. Are we together? So this is a classic example that you have. This is what, we, what is happening here. You see that the Arrhenius equation says you plot lin k versus one over temperature, the temperature in Kelvin. So you come up with a, a graph that is going to look like this. You've got all these, uh, 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 data points, and uh, then you pick a temperature. What temperature do you want uh, to predict uh, the drug uh, decomposition? So in this case, they used 25. Okay, so this is uh, 25 uh, degrees Celsius, but first of all, you convert it to Kelvins. So it is coming somewhere there you draw a line to meet uh, the straight uh, line that you drew earlier, and then you extrapolate, bring it to the y-axis for you to determine uh, lean K at 25 degrees Celsius. And of course, after that, you get the antilog of this, okay? So the last step is the extrapolation and determining of uh, the rate constant at a desired storage temperature. In this case, the desired storage temperature is uh, here, 25 degrees Celsius, and you have. So from there then, it becomes uh, straightforward. Since you already know the order of the reaction, you take that K and uh, uh, include that uh, it becomes uh, uh, your rate constant in the appropriate order of reaction. And from there, you can then make uh, the necessary assumptions, okay, and make uh, substitutions as you like. The substitutions you are going to make are going to be dependent on the assumptions that you are making. So if the assumption is that uh, 
uh, you are determining the share of life as, as being, for example, 10% uh, degradation uh, of, uh, uh, of the initial concentration, then that means uh, you simply have to change where there is the C, the C then becomes C 90% or 0.9% of the uh, 0.9 of the initial concentration. Uh, we did the similar thing when we are looking at determination of the half-life. So similarly, you follow that uh, substitution. I'm leaving it open because it is not a must. Now, you get to see when you are reading different textbooks, uh, you might get an impression that um, a uh, share of life means 10% decomposition of the, uh, of the product. Uh, please note that uh, that is an assumption and different uh, uh, products are going to degrade differently. Not all of them will, will be required to degrade by 10% uh, uh, for you to have a look at the share of life. Some of the drugs might remain very potent even after 30% degradation. Uh, and so how you approach uh, uh, determination or prediction of, predi uh, of, of shelf life will be dependent on uh, the information that you, uh, you are given. Okay. So several limitations uh, and uh, uh, several difficulties and limitations are involved in this aspect of accelerated stability testing. Uh, we make a number of assumptions to use this principle to determine the, uh, the shelf life. But there's also a realization that uh, there is a possibility that the application of high stress may cause reactions that would not take place under lower stress associated with normal storage condition. And uh, this would be a case in a number of cases. We've used high, uh, high temperatures, high stress conditions, but there's a possibility that those degradation processes simply take place at higher stress conditions, they might not necessarily take place at normal storage conditions. Okay, there's also uncertainty surrounding the term uh, normal storage conditions. And this again, uh, like I indicated, it is just normal and it did normal in, in commas. And this will need to be clearly defined depending on where the product is going. Okay. Then allowance, uh, unless storage conditions are defined pre precisely on the container, allowance should be made for variations in the conditions likely to be encountered under normal, uh, normal storage conditions. So it's not always in strict sense uh, that what we predict is what is likely to happen. There must be uh, that allowance given that uh, somewhere, something else might uh, might happen. Okay, so attempts to allow for such a contingency often involve accepting the shortest uh, half life for a range of conditions. This is why uh, there's there's been a big discussion. Uh, this statement here. You find a lot of discussions in the medical fraternity that. Uh, Maybe perhaps even after a product has, has uh, expired as indicated by the expiration date on the container, there is a possibility that uh, maybe you can continue using it for uh, a certain period of time. Uh, it's probably from the misunderstanding that uh, when you are predicting uh, uh, the shelf life during uh, product development, we tend to go for the shortest shelf life that you get uh, from a range of conditions that are likely to be encountered. This is for you to be on a safer side. Uh, you want uh, people to stop using the product uh, as quickly as possible uh, from the moment you anticipate that you can begin to have uh, uh, difficulties or instabilities in the product. 
but there's a lot that needs to, to happen. Uh, what us as, uh, as pharmacists or scientists must take is that because of the uncertainty of what can happen beyond the expiration date, the product should never be used beyond the expiry date. I'm sure those who are in practice have already encountered uh, this aspect of practice and the debate that goes on, including on social media. The climate uh, of the country in which the product is to be marketed is also particularly important in defining this range. Uh, so you have to ensure that you use as much as possible uh, a mimic of uh, the climatic conditions uh, in the country where the product is going to be marketed. Uh, and uh, this is a, a huge problem, especially if you think that uh, uh, these, uh, most of these products are manufactured elsewhere. Uh, perhaps another reason why Africa needs to be producing its own products. Uh, there's a difference in mimicking and experiencing the actual climatic conditions. So decomposition in formulated uh, uh, products often proceed via complex uh, reaction series. Uh, so there's also realization that uh, decomposition might not follow just one reaction. Uh, it might be a complex uh, series of reactions. And so, and that is not accounted for when you are considering accelerated stability studies. They may involve uh, simultaneous consecutive or chain reactions uh, because the products themselves are complex systems. You are combining a lot of materials together to come up with a product. Another assumption that we make when we are predicting the shelf life of uh, uh, a product is that uh, the order of the reaction doesn't change. So if you have a look at uh, this graph, for example, I was saying you generate data at 40 degrees Celsius, 50 and 60, and you use this data to determine the order of the reaction. And then you determine the rate constants at all these uh, uh, temperatures. The assumption here is that uh, the order of the reaction is not changing, it is remaining constant throughout. But there may be cases where the order of the reaction may change after a period of time and uh, exposure to different conditions. So that's another limitation. Predictions of the extent of decomposition at future times are then uh, impracticable and the prolonged tests under normal storage conditions must be carried out. Uh, this is why uh, I was uh, mentioned earlier that we must keep the product under normal circumstances, uh, normal storage conditions uh, for a prolonged period of time. This is going to be acting as a reference and you can come and compare your stability data to that of accelerated stability uh, data and see if there is a huge difference. And if there is a huge difference, we get to see in practice that a number of products have been recorded simply based on uh, this uh, finding. If you find that there is a big difference between the way the product is decomposing uh, between uh, normal storage conditions and accelerated stability, uh, you might need to record the product and indicate appropriate expiry, uh, expiry dates on those products. However, we must uh, note that in spite of all these difficulties, the application of accelerated stability testing uh, to pharmaceutical products is often useful and predicted uh, shelf lives are sufficiently accurate. So even if we have all these issues, it's just about the best shot we have at the moment to predict uh, the shelf life. And in most cases, we find that the data generated is useful 
and the predicted uh, shelf life is sufficiently accurate. That's the end of the lecture. I'll take questions. I've got eight minutes remaining. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just have a concern, sir. Uh, are you going to make the lecture available for everybody to access, seeing that it's being recorded? Uh, no, I won't. Do I have to make it available? Yes, it would be nice. I think, uh, uh, personally, I would like to do some revision. I would like to listen to your explanation. A deleted thing. Okay, I will think about it. I did not uh, intend to share. Uh, do we have other people who are sharing the same concern? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so, uh, me too, because like the uh, network was, was bad, so it was cutting. I didn't get everything sure I was saying. So I'd like as well if you can uh, share this to like this to the record so I can listen to what you. I missed some stars. I didn't get everything. Okay, we'll share the recording. Okay, okay, sir. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, to help you in. Uh... Sorry, sir. Um, on the concern, I have the concern on the graph, like on how to predict the, um, the order of the reaction where you said um, you have to pick the temperature and then uh, in terms of like in you in choose uh, about um, choosing the time it says you just um, actually you just do the time in one hour after one hour now in terms of degradation I didn't understood on that I want you just to go go back a bit okay so uh what you need to understand is that uh, the information I was using was actually a bit really, I, I was just getting the data from the head, just to give an example, okay? Uh, ideally, what we, we get is, uh, I was giving an example, if you have uh, a temperature of 40 degrees, for example, you start indicating, you want to note the initial uh, concentration, and then you note the concentration uh, after different time points. These time points could be anything uh, depending on what you choose as being appropriate for your experiments. So I just picked the time. So let's say one, two, four, six, and so on. And then as time goes on, we know that this degradation that is going to be happening, meaning uh, the concentration the initial concentration is going to be decreasing. So you move from 100%, you go to 95 and so on, because the Z degradation that is taking place. Once you have this data set, it means basically what you are generating here is time and concentration. When you have time and concentration, you can use this data set to determine the order of reaction. And I would want to think that you did not miss the lecture on how to determine the order of the reaction because we did this before this first leave. If you are not sure, you can talk to your colleagues. So you can use this data to uh, determine the order of the reaction. Once you determine the order of the reaction, you can proceed and determine the rate constant. Once you determine the rate constant, you can use an appropriate integrated equation uh, for you uh, to uh, determine the shelf life. Again, the shelf life is about the information that you have. What have you been taught? What is, at what point are you predicting that the product will no longer be effective? Some, it will be 10%. Some, it will be 20%, depending on a specific product. However, I must also mention here that if you have not been given any information regarding the percent degradation, 
at which the product ceases to be uh, effective, then you must make an assumption of 10%, always. Okay, so if you've got a question, it is asking you to predict shelf life, but you've not been taught at what point it ceases to be uh, effective, use the assumption of 10%. So in order to uh, assist you to the practice uh, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload practice questions on Moodle just after this lecture. So get access and uh, mm. see if you can practice those questions on how to calculate the shelf life. So I'm sending a tutorial sheet which you can use where, wherever you are. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question, sir. Yes. On the factorial analysis, do you only analyze the humidity and the light intensity, or maybe the temperature can also be analyzed? Well, if you have a look at the, 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 the factorial analysis, we had indicated that we are considering factors that are not considered by uh, the Arrhenius equation. So temperature covers the uh, is covered in the Arrhenius, Arrhenius. Oh, okay. Uh, equation. Okay. okay. Oh. So there could be other factors. We, we, we could be considering many other factors uh, apart from the two that we have uh, we have mentioned. But temperature must be we are reserving it to uh, Arrhenius. the Arrhenius. Thank you very much, Sam. Yeah. Okay, we have come to the end of uh, the lecture. Uh, thank you for attending. We are hoping that we can normalize this. Uh, we, I don't think that we will get back to normal anytime soon. Mm. Even if they ask you to come back to school, I don't think I'm so enthusiastic about coming to your class. I don't know where you are coming from. It mm. could take time before we can start meeting face to face. So this should be considered <laughs> a normal thing. Uh, I think we'll do this quite a lot. Uh, we've taken time to start, but at least we've started and uh, hopefully we can be consistent. Uh, so the next uh, time I want us to have a look at uh, um, selection mm -hmm. of excipients. Did we look at selection of excipients? No, no, yeah. not so. No. So that will be our next thing. We'll have a look at uh, selection of excipients. How do you choose excipients and what are excipients mm -hmm. anyway? And then once we do that, I'll breeze through that. I'm hoping that next week we start looking at manufacturing of tablets. Mm -hmm. So we are going to try and move quite fast. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good day. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir.